uh, work by Jens Groth and Victor Schub uh, about the uh, security of ECDSA with additive key derivation and pre-signatures. And Victor is going to give the talk. Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay through my mask. Yes, I come from a planet where we have a pandemic, so I'm still there in my mind, at least. So how do, how do I... How do I advance? How, how do I, I, I didn't touch anything when that happened. Okay. Okay, so let me start uh, with some context. Uh, so I'm currently at an organization called Definity, which is building something called the Internet Computer, which is a distributed platform uh, for executing smart contracts in a secure way. Uh, it does great things and it's uh, amazingly fast and everything. And what we want to do though, is we want to build uh, a new threshold ECDSA signing protocol, but that's what we're implementing. Um, and it's, we're currently integrating it into uh, our, our, our protocol, our larger protocol. Um, and we're doing this because uh, we think that it might be a good idea to allow uh, smart contracts running on the internet computer to be able to securely hold and spend Bitcoin and other types of cryptocurrencies. Um, and of course, uh, most of these currently still use ECDSA. So we need uh, a, a protocol for that. So. Um, this is the MPC session. I'm not really going to talk about a secure uh, um, multi-party protocol for ECDSA signing. That's in a companion paper. In this talk, I'll be talking about just the analysis of, of a non-threshold ECDSA that's appropriate for uh, analyzing uh, a distributed protocol. So you'll see what I mean in a little bit. So. Just let's recall ECDSA signatures. We have an elliptic curve uh, of order Q uh, and a generator G. And the notation I'll use here is my secret key will be little d and my public key will be this big D and I'll use additive notation. And yeah, so this is ECDSA. You hash the message. You point with a laser pointer that doesn't work. You, you, you pick a random R and you, and you multiply your generator by that. So you get the group element R. And then you apply this funny function C, which is this conversion function. It doesn't really matter what it is, but that uh, converts a point on the curve to uh, a number mod Q. And then you test a little um, uh, corner case that never really happens. And then you compute S as R inverse times H plus TD. And the signature is just this pair ST. Um, and then you verify a signature uh, by just kind of doing the obvious thing in reverse. Uh, you hash the message and then you compute S inverse times H, multiply that by the group element G, S inverse times T, multiply that by the public key D. And then you check that you get a, a non-zero point on the curve and that the conversion function maps to T. And so I'll uh, keep this kind of basic verification equation up here. Um, as you'll notice, uh, there's a uh, part of the signing process is independent of the message M and you can uh, do some pre-computations and a lot of people have of course noticed this before. So. Uh, you can compute the random R, do the multiplication of R times G, and then do even the conversion function uh, all independently of the message M. So I'll call uh, this group element R a pre-signature. Now, if you're doing a, an MPC implementation of this, you'll probably be using some kind of a secret sharing scheme. And so uh, we can do a pre-computation, which in addition to computing this uh, group element R, this pre-signature R, we can also pre-compute sharings of little r, the, the random number r. And then also we'll, we can pre-compute um, kind of a beaver triple kind of thing, uh, kind of adapted to ECDSA a little bit. So we can compute the random number u mod q shared among all the parties. And then we can uh, use u to multiply both uh, r and uh, a d. So we get r prime as a sharing of r times u and d prime as a sharing of d times u. 
So we've got two random numbers and then products of them. So we can also do this as kind of a, a pre-computation in a distributed protocol. And then once we have all this, then to sign a given message M, we can just do a local computation uh, where we compute the hash of the message. And then we, assuming standard secret sharing, we can just locally compute H times U, the hash times U plus T times this, this D prime up here. And then once we each party locally computes that, they can just open their shares, broadcast their shares, and then everybody can combine them. So we open here V and uh, uh, R prime. So V is H U plus T D U, and R prime is R times U. You cancel the use and you get uh, the F component of the signature out. Um, yeah, so that's uh, pretty much it. And I guess uh, you're also right. And, and you're going to open, uh, and you also already have T. Okay, so once we have this pre signature group element R plus this pre shared data, then the point of all of this, then the latency for a signature is just one round of communication. Everybody broadcasts a share, everybody can combine them, and you have a signature. Okay, so that's one. So pre computation is a is a technique that's used in uh, many ECDSA threshold implementations. Another thing that's relevant to threshold ECDSA and ECDSA in the cryptocurrency uh, community is something called additive key derivation. So here the idea is that starting from a secret key little d, we can compute kind of an offset of that secret key d plus e. Um, and the corresponding public key, which is just uh, the original public key plus E times the generator, uh, where this E is kind of a public value and an additive tweak that's typically derived by some kind of hashing process applied to some identifier. So, it's a, so the main thing is that E is a, a public value. Um, if you're familiar at all with um, Bitcoin and, and related cryptocurrencies, there's a standard called uh, BIP32 that's uh, essentially a special case of this, uh, this additive key derivation. And it's used in Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies to implement something called hierarchical deterministic wallets. Um, so if we want to do something like this in a threshold implementation, first of all, it's fairly easy to implement because uh, everything, this tweaking, this, this derived key is, is a linear operation, basically. So uh, that typically means that uh, we can efficiently implement that using secret sharing. Also, uh, it's useful in a, in a threshold setting. It's, it's really important um, to use this kind of thing to keep the key maintenance costs to a minimum. Um, let me elaborate on that a little bit. <clears throat> so for every signing key that we have, uh, uh, we have to share that signing key among all the parties, right? And so, and then we're going to have to reshare this key occasionally, specifically uh, when the network membership changes, we're going to have to reshare the secret key. And uh, if we want to proactively uh, refresh the secret shares on a, on a regular basis. So just imagine uh, we had, you know, tens of thousands of keys, one for every user, and then every, you know, every few minutes, whenever we want to do a proactive reshare, we want to have to re run this resharing protocol for all these tens of thousands of users, even though maybe most of these users are not even using their key at this time, right? Maybe they're not even uh, uh, generating that many signatures. So um, because of these costs, we actually don't want to have all of these independent signing keys. We, we would rather if we could have kind of like one master secret key and then just derive uh, secret keys, secret signing keys for each user using a simple key derivation such as this one here, additive key derivation. Um, also, in addition to all that, uh, the, the maintenance costs might also include any additional protocols for like backing up the signing key, right? It'd be a, kind of a disaster if people lost their Bitcoin signing keys uh, and there wasn't some kind of a backup. So that's additive key derivation. And when you uh, incorporate additive key derivation into ECDSA, well, you're right. So you're essentially just replacing the public key D by D plus E times a generator. So when you plug that into this equation here, you just get a, uh, a T times E times G extra factor here. So this is the new 
the, down here on the bottom here is the new verification equation that you get for uh, if you want to verify a signature with respect to a derived key. So what do we know about ECDSA security? Um, typically, in your uh, average uh, um, threshold ECDSA protocol, you'll find that there's a security proof that reduces the security of the protocol to the security of the non-threshold ECDSA signature scheme. Hopefully, that's the case. But if we use pre-signatures and or, in combination, additive key derivation, uh, we will need to consider an attack on the non-threshold ECDSA scheme that incorporates this usage, right? Re re revealing pre-signatures prior to messages being chosen and also uh, deriving uh, public keys in this way. So what's previously known about uh, these different kind of modes of operation? Well, first of all, if we just have plain old ECDSA, um, the unfortunate thing about that is we don't really have a good reduction uh, from ECDSA to any kind of standard problem, but we do know that in the generic group model, as a result of Brown from 2002, that shows that um, this is secure in the so-called generic group model, uh, under some collision resistance and, and random pre-image resistance um, assumptions on the hash function. Then if we look at um, ECDSA with pre-signatures, well, actually there's a paper uh, by Ron Kennedy and friends in 2020 who showed that uh, a proof of security in the generic group model plus the random Oracle model um, showed that ECDSA with pre-signatures was secure. Um, for ECDSA with additive key derivation, there's actually no general results uh, prior to our work, at least that I know of. Uh, there are some results with various restrictions on the attack, on the types of messages that you sign, on the, on the ways in which you use the public keys, but uh, there haven't been any real general results. And then, well, in particular, uh, if you look at ECDA with pre-signatures and additive key derivations, there's nobody's ever really looked at this at all, even though uh, this mode has been, this, this mode of operation has been advocated in the literature for use. I won't say who advocated it, but because it's not really <laughs> substantiated by anything. Um, but um, yeah, and it, but you can see why you would want to use it, right? For those, there's, there's compelling reasons to want to use both of these modes of operation in combination. So here's what happens if you were to use pre-signatures plus a key, additive key derivation. There's actually an attack of sorts. So uh, here's how the attack works. You make one pre-signature query to get this uh, random group element R and the, and the corresponding, uh, you, you apply the um, conversion function to get the corresponding number T mod Q. And then the main step is step two where we want to find uh, message M tweak E and another message M star and a tweak E star. So we want to find these four things. So this attack, uh, the, the name of this attack is called the meme attack. So the name was discovered by Tal Rabin, who wanted to make sure I gave her credit for the name, for the meme. And then what you want to do is find M-E-M-E, M-E, -E, M star, E star, such that this equation holds here, H plus T E equals H star plus T E star. And the only real constraint is that the tweaks should be different. The hashes, the, the messages could even be the same message. It doesn't matter. Um, and so, so once you find these four values, then you ask for a signature um, on message M. Um, you, you, ask for a, you ask for a signature ST using this pre-signature on the message M with tweak E, and that immediately gives you uh, a signature on M star with respect to tweak E star. I mean, this is just a trivial math, right? So you can uh, look at the verification equations and see that that's what you get. So this is uh, a valid signature on M star with respect to E star. So that's kind of a, a, a simple thing to see. Now, uh, the, the hard part, of course, is the step two to find the meme. And this is essentially a four sum problem. Um, 
uh, you can kind of just look at the hash outputs as basically random numbers. And the tweaks are also kind of random numbers multiplied by this fixed value t. So you're looking for four random numbers that add up in, in this particular way. So this is a well-studied problem called the four sum problem. Uh, Wagner had a nice paper also 20 years ago that shows that you can do this in time cube root of q uh, instead of square root of q, which is what you would expect the, the time it would take to uh, attack ECDSA generically. So it's still, you know, not a polynomial time attack, but it's still, uh, I guess, a, a bug rather than a feature in using this kind of mode of operation. So uh, I want to talk to, about some ways to mitigate against this type of attack, and then um, I'll present our results, which uh, basically is uh, uh, some analyses of these mitigations in the generic group model. So one idea that we had um, to uh, prevent this kind of cube root type of attack is to use what we call re-randomized pre-signatures. And when I show this to you, you'll think it's just kind of cheating in some way. So the idea is this. We start with a base pre-signature, just as a, a normal pre-signature, but I'll call it a base pre-signature, R prime. So you, you pre-compute those. Now, when a signing request comes in, what we do only after the message has been committed to by the, by the attacker, we replace this, this base pre-signature by the actual pre-signature. So we, we generate or we obtain a random number delta and basically add that to a delta times the generator to our base pre-signature. So the important thing is that this delta is a public random value. Um, so we don't have, it's not secret shared or anything. So it's just derived publicly. It's kind of like a, you could get it from like a random beacon or some other threshold uh, signing protocol that you could use uh, like a BLS signature scheme, for example. That's what we actually do in our imp implementation. So it's, so it's a little bit cheating because we're gonna use uh, another threshold uh, signature scheme, namely BLS actually in our implementation to generate this public randomness. Uh, but other than that, it's sufficient to implement. It may introduce some additional latency in the sense that um, uh, you, you can only generate this delta after the, the message to be signed has been committed to. At least in our implementation, it, it doesn't introduce any latency because anyway, a signing request has to pass through, pass through a whole consensus protocol. And by the time that happens, you can easily start releasing the, the shares of delta before, before that happens. So that's one mitigation, this re-randomized pre-signatures. The other one is, I'll call it uh, homogeneous key derivation. So here the idea is that <clears throat> instead of having a single kind of master secret key D, we're gonna have two master secret keys, D and D prime, and then a corresponding master public key, big D and big D prime. Then once we get a tweak, we're gonna derive the secret key as a linear combination of D and D prime. So we're gonna, the new secret key will be D plus the tweak E times D prime, and then the corresponding public key will be uh, that. So, the, this, so that's a mitigation, and I'll show you in a minute um, what it buys you. But right away, just one disadvantage that I'll point out is that um, it's not compatible with BIP32, and we wanted to have some compatibility with BIP32, so we didn't actually implement this. Um, but one could. And um, finally, you can actually, if you wanted to, combine both of these mitigations. And you'll see on the next slide that this also buys you something. You can combine re-randomized pre-signatures with homogeneous key derivation. So this is what we analyzed in this paper is actually we have like nine different theorems. So let me just uh, walk through kind of briefly and highlight some of the main uh, salient features. So first we start out looking at no key derivation and we look at uh, no pre-signatures, pre-sigs and re-randomized pre-signatures. So this first result here is basically Brown's theorem from uh, 2002. This says that in the, in the generic group model, the, the advantage that an adversary has in breaking the signature scheme is just the advantage of finding a collision, that's this epsilon CR. 
plus n times the advantage of finding a, a, a pre-image of a random number under the hash function. And then there's this strange uh, Z ZPR, which is the advantage of finding a pre-image of zero of the hash function. And then you have the n squared over Q, which comes from the usual uh, generic group model kind of analysis. So that's actually Brown's result. Um, yeah, n here is the number of queries that counts group operation queries in the generic group model, uh, signing queries, et cetera. Then if we uh, look at, again, still no key derivation, but with pre-signatures, then we get uh, another result, which here, uh, let's see, um, qualitatively what's different. You'll see here we have a factor u times n instead of an n here. Uh, and then also, so U here is the number of unused pre signatures at any point in time. You can generate pre signatures and then you consume them when you sign. And then there's at any point in time, there's some number of unused pre signatures. And that, for whatever reason, comes into the analysis. Uh, we also have another complexity assumption here, which is I'll call ratio resistance, this epsilon RR. So this is uh, the uh, abound on the advantage to find two messages who, uh, who's, do, who's uh, the, if you look at their hashes, their ratios hit some random number. So um, this is similar to the result approved by Kennedy et al. in 2020. It's a little bit tighter actually than their result, but that's not that interesting. Um, then if we look at re-randomized pre-signatures, this first mitigation I told you about. So, so you'll see here that you know, this reduction here in the second column is much sloppier than the, than the original brown result. And the nice thing you'll notice about this slide, even though there are nine boxes, a lot of them are the same. In particular, everything in column three is going to be the same as everything in column one. So when we apply the re-randomized pre-signatures um, mitigation, we end up back in column one as if there were no uh, pre-signatures at all. Then we look at additive key derivation. Um, and again, you can see here that uh, everything gets slightly more painful and, and, and the reduction gets uh, sloppier and sloppier. Here we have to multiply this uh, random pre-image thing by a factor uh, of uh, the size of the tweak set. So here, in this particular analysis, I'm looking at the set of allowed tweaks. I'm viewing the tweaks as the output of some random oracle. I'll say something more about that in a minute. Um, but assuming that we view the tweaks themselves as the output of some random oracle, we can kind of make the adversary commit to the set of all possible tweaks in advance. And then we have a, a guessing argument that it kind of inflates the, the, the reduction here. Then we come to pre. Uh, this is okay. This is the worst of all possible word, worlds. Here is when you combine additive key derivation with pre-signatures. I showed you this quote-unquote attack. The good news is that's it's no worse than that. We can basically we basically show that there are some specific instances of the for some problem that you can bounce the the, the bounce the the probability of breaking it by. So you get a reduction to a for some problem. And then, as usual, if we add re-randomized pre-signatures to that, we get back to column one. So that's good. So this is actually what we, we implement, additive key derivation with re-randomized pre-signatures. It gives you a pretty good bound. Then finally, if we look at homogeneous key derivation, the good news is here, column, no, row three is the same as row one. So uh, when you, so, so homogeneous key derivation is actually uh, a more, a more powerful mitigation. So here you just see we get everything as in column one. In particular, this cell down here on the lower right is the same as Brown's cell up on the, the right. So if you do homogeneous key derivation plus re-randomized pre-signatures, you're like living in the same world that Brown was living in 20 years ago. So that's nice. It gives you a nice tight reduction. And um, I'll finish up by just mentioning a couple other features of our analysis. I won't be doing any proofs here. It's all done in a, a generic group model. Um, there's been some complaints about the generic group model, especially as it relates to the elliptic curves. 
and, 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 and ECDSA in particular. So what we do to kind of address some of those complaints is to, uh, you know, in, so in the generic group model, we're basically gonna choose uh, a random encoding of the group uh, we have a group of uh, prime order Q and we're going to just pick a random encoding of it. And then the adversary gets black box access to add and do group operations on these random encodings. But our encoding space, so to speak, is actually an elliptic curve of prime order Q. It's just that we ignore the group law, right? So the group law is just, uh, is, has nothing to do with the group law of the elliptic curve, but the space in which the group elements, the encoded group elements live is, is is an elliptic curve except again to address complaints uh we inf we enforce the condition that the inverse in the group of an element on this curve really respects the usual inverse law right and this gets at um this allows us to model some quirks in ECDSA, in particular malleability. In particular, if you have a signature ST on a message M, then so is minus ST. So we can actually model this. And not only can we model the malleability, we can actually then prove in this particular GGM model that uh, ECDSA is only malleable in this way, which isn't surprising really. We also analyzed the standardized BIP32 construction and show that it's actually indifferentiable from a random oracle, really a public random oracle, but it doesn't really matter in this application. And we also analyzed the additive key derivation uh, without using random oracles and just using kind of concrete assert security assumptions on the interaction between the ECDSA hash and the hash that's used to derive the tweaks. So that's it. Thanks, and uh, I'll make a shameless plug. Do we're all, we're still looking to hire people at Definity? Um, thank you. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, are there questions for the last speaker? Um, maybe a quick one. Um, so, in addition, or except for the meme attack that you had, are there any known attacks uh, on, uh, if you have only uh, pre six or additive key derivation, but not both together? Well, we did, I mean, we, we I do mean, prove this theorem, right? Lower bounds, but does it translate into um, something? Because you have a bit of a loss, right? In comparison to the... Oh, yeah, there's some other, yeah, there's some other sloppiness in here, like this extra factor here, and there are various extra factors here and there that come into just making a standard kind of hybrid argument or guessing argument, and, and it's typical, right? In those cases, I, there may be attacks, there may not be attacks, we didn't really dive too deep into that. There could be attacks there that match the upper bounds, but I actually wouldn't want to bet any cool. money. Thanks a lot. Okay. So uh, let's thank all the speakers from the last session again. And uh, this concludes day one of uh, Eurocrypt. Have fun. This is, I was just curious.